Welcome to the Bringing Intimacy Back Show, where intimacy is real. If you desire to intimately connect with yourself, your significant other, children, family, friends, community, and your higher power, this show is for you. Thus, we explore intimate topics, inspiring life stories, spirituality, and insightful tips on strengthening relationships. This show is hosted by Dr. April and her co-host, Dr. Kelly. Now let's get this episode of the Bringing Intimacy Back Show started, because we share with you the secret power to intimacy to create a life you love or love the life you create. Now here's your host, Dr. April and co-host, Dr. Kelly. Welcome to the Bring an Intimacy Show, where intimacy is real. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. How are you doing today? We're doing fantastic. I yes. finally got my coffee figured out. I was drinking caffeine, caffeine-free, de- decaf. I thought it was the daylight savings time, but I bought the wrong coffee, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay. So I finally got that figured out. Yes, yes. Well, one of the things that we finally got figured out, um, before we get really started into our show, I want to talk to the audience about Patreon, because we are really trying to provide our audience with such quality shows. And so now we've partnered up with Patreon and we have a $5 a month prescription to get bonus content, some true um, tips and stuff from Dr. Kelly and also from me, we're gonna have a tip a week and some bonus things going on. And so if you are interested in learning more about the show, getting some insights into it, please sign up to Patreon, go to Patreon slash BIB podcast. Yes, and subscribe there. It's so you know one cup of coffee. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know what you get paid per hour, but let me tell you, I know it's not five bucks <laughs> or no, mine. So to get tips from Dr. April, that's something. Yes, yes. It's got some value. Definitely. And since you were just saying pay by the hour, you know what? When I was working by the hour, um, and other people were determining my schedule and that kind of stuff, the one thing that I felt like I didn't have was a voice. You know, and so what I'm so happy about today's show, it's about finding your voice, you know, which is like empowering. Yeah, it is empowering. I am listening today with both ears. Okay, good. And my heart. Yes, yes, yes. Because I think when you find your voice, you actually find your value. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And so today we have um, an exceptional person who has not only found her voice, she's found her value, and she is amazing. I would like to welcome to the show, Ashley Bernardi. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you so much, Dr. April and Dr. Kelly, for having me. What an honor. Yes, yes. So um, let me tell you guys a little bit about Ashley. So Ashley is the founder of Nadia Media, which is a nationally renowned full-service media relations and media training firm. She's a former network producer. Did you know that? So she was in the background, yes, of a CBS early show in the morning, yes. So she's also co-hosts her award-winning podcast, Girls, Two Girls Talking, which is a podcast of girls sitting there talking about a variety of things, about finding their voices and motherhood and working and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that also, I mean, that's amazing. But one of the things that um, I found was amazing about her life is how she grew up. She grew up and her father, when I think she was around 11, passed away from a sudden heart attack and how that changed her life. And then also she's had to struggle with a a disease, um, which has also like, you know, really shattered her life. And so between all this stuff of being, you know, when you see about all of her success and you're like, wow, she's done such great things. No, this woman has survived trauma. And that is kind of also what she's writing in her n- new book that's coming out soon called Not So Strong. So Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot. And, um, you know, I have to be honest, this is really one of the first times that um, I'm sharing more about my like personal life and trauma. I'm usually out there on stages talking about finding your voice, sharing your message. And now I'm like, well, okay, we're going to go deep today. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Put that seatbelt on. Yep. Yep. I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. So one of the things that we ask all our guests, um, since we, this show is about intimacy. Okay. How do you actually define 
intimacy? Oh, intimacy. This is intimacy can, can be defined with like first yourself, like getting intimate with yourself, connecting with yourself, going within. You can be intimate with yourself by like really going within and finding that connection. For me, it might look like meditating or writing. I can get, I get very intimate with myself when I'm writing and I get a lot of aha moments that way, but also being intimate outwardly too. It can mean both like that, that inward and outward way that you express yourself. You can express yourself intimately. And it doesn't mean like that sexual connection. It could, if you wanted it to be, but getting intimate with someone is really expressing your true authenticity. Um, so it's a lot of it. It's like finding that inner voice and expressing it outwards in an authentic way. That's what intimacy can look like. Yeah. And so um, I know you've written this, this book. Um, what made you decide to share with the world about your intimate moments? That oh, made you yeah. Honest you are. That is, thank you for asking. It's such a great question. So I wrote Not So Strong first I was inspired when the pandemic happened because when it started happening, I felt like the world was going through a collective trauma, which we were, and we still are. And I said to myself, well, wait, I've been here before. I've been in this space mm. before, in this like intimate space of trauma. Um, what, and I also, at the same time, I have access to some of the world's greatest healers. They're my friends, they're my clients because of my work as a publicist. So I said, I, I want to write about my experience and I want to offer hope to people because while these moments can are very, very scary uh, and we should honor them as, as we're feeling them, um, I don't want people to push these feelings aside or bury them and not experience them, them in real time. Because what I did when my dad died um, when I was 11 years old and it was very traumatic. He was at home. My sister was at home. My mom was at home and he suffered a sudden death heart attack. And, um, I tried to save his life. My mom tried to, we, the three of us tried to save his life. Wow. I called 911. My sister was nine years old and she mm. was back doing CPR back and forth. I went and get, I got the neighbors. Um, and he died and that changed my whole life trajectory. But what I did was I buried that trauma within. I went back to school a week later. I don't know why like that society think that's okay to send a kid back to school after they experience something like that. But I think that was probably the first mistake that I made. I mean, I had no idea. And it's, it's certainly no fault to my mom's. No one really knows how to go through a trauma like this. Um, but what I found that I did for years and years to come was just bury how I was feeling. I felt angry. I felt guilty. I felt shame. I couldn't save his life. I, I was um, sad. I had PTSD. I had all these things, but I didn't talk about it. Like even as I grew up, I didn't even want to tell my friends my dad died. I was just holding this all this trauma in me. Like I, I'm like pointing to my chest right now because I feel like it was very heavy on my chest. Um, even though I had therapists that tried to help, of course, my mom, my family, like all everyone tried to help, but this was really an inside job for Ashley. So Fast forward, um, you know, into my early 30s, I had spent a very long period of my life ignoring that. So how did that come out? It came out in other ways, in people pleasing, through alcohol, through destructive relationships. I mean, really just not taking good care of myself because I just kept like avoiding those yucky, messy, intimate emotions and I wasn't processing them. I wasn't moving through them. They were just getting stuck in my body. So in my early thirties, um, I had gotten married and I had, um, two little kids at home. I started physically getting really ill, like ill to the point where I thought it was the flu. I thought it was a stomach bug. Um, I, I started losing all this weight. Um, and it turns out I had, and I ended up suffering for about a year after I had my third child. That's when this illness, this was a mystery illness at this point came like tenfold. I was hospitalized. I was taken by the ambulance to the hospital. I lost my vision. Oh my I, gosh. I lost, I mean, like I literally couldn't see all I saw was flashing lights in my vision. It was like, oh it, it was gosh. lights yeah. going off at all times. Um, I was bedridden. I couldn't care for my children. I saw so <sighs> many doctors and, um, finally after months and months of this, and I was, I was at my point of despair. I wanted to die. I was asking God, like, please take me don't want to live like this anymore. Um, and for the sake of my family, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want them to suffer anymore. I'm ready. Let's go. I'm done. Um, 
God had other plans for me. (laughs) Um, But it was at that moment where I started having that conversation with God that I found that there were so many emotions that started coming out of me. Mm. Um, But I will say I was diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. So I was treated with an IV pick line, but that physical healing was only one component. Lyme disease was my greatest gift because that opened up the door that I had been ignoring for wow 20 years of my life and all the trauma came out it all came out the anger the sadness the grief and it came out through tears it came out through the illness it was just it's like my body had been overloaded because i had spent my whole life holding it in and and out it came so what did i do i started um i started meditating i started Um, with 30 seconds and getting up to 30 minutes, I started breathing. I started doing yoga. I started focusing on my spirituality, talking to spirit guides, um, letting my feelings start starting to come out through what I call sacred writing, speaking to spiritual mentors, joining a church. This was a full like year long plus process for me to healing. And this was about five years ago today. So now I can say that, and this is why I wrote the book, like I have been there. I have been in the depths of despair. I know how you feel. I am with you. This pandemic is hard, but if you allow yourself to actually feel and process these emotions as they're coming up, your life is going to change and it's going to change for the better. And it's going to be so magical. So that's what inspired me long answer to that's what inspired me to write not so strong because the other part of this is that my entire life, I was told that I was so strong. We're all put on, we all put on that mask mm-hmm. of strength. You're so strong. You know, you just, um, you're so strong. You just saved your dad's life. And my dad was an army colonel. He's so strong. So you got to be like a soldier's daughter. And I always felt anything but strong, but society and culture had told me that I should put on this mask of strength. So I did. And it was at my detriment. It, it nearly killed me by faking it. They say fake it till you make it. But yeah. I think that it's the most inaccurate and unhealthy thing that you could ever tell yourself or someone because that is telling someone to push their true feelings and emotions deep within and not process them. So that's where the book was born. Look at that vulnerability. Wow, I'm just stunned. What a voice. And I just imagine you as an 11 year old girl and yeah. like in that traumatic thing happening, one of the most uh, stunning things that you said, and you said a lot of that in that answer was just sending children back to school a little bit too early. We don't understand. A lot of people don't. So there's a huge grief basis to your book and then uh, the trauma and then also the spirituality that was so encouraging. Mm-hmm. I, I'm so encouraged to hear your story. Thank you. I mean, and that one point on grief, I was just talking to a friend earlier today who's a doctor and we were talking about grief and we were talking about that moment of like me going back to school a week later. And she's like, this is what's wrong with society that like back in the day or like in other cultures, people used to wear like a black wrap around their arm for a year to show that they were in the grieving process. We no longer do that. And we were also talking about relating it to the pandemic where the whole, our entire culture is still in this like PTSD mode. Like I'm sure you all know, I have friends who have passed away from this this deadly virus, has anyone really processed what's happening? Like the number of deaths that we're experiencing in our country, we haven't collectively grieved together. And I think that's gonna be at our detriment a couple years later, if we're not gonna allow ourselves to go through and feel what we're feeling right now. And I don't think we are as a society, it's gonna come out worse several years from now in the same way it did for me. Right, and so Ashley, um, in your story, you talked about, um in the hospital and then given a little bit of relief from the pain and then how that opened up. I'm just still, I'm like stuck there. <laughs> yeah. So there were many hospital visits. Um, and actually in the middle of all this, there's another layer in that, um, while after I had my baby and the symptoms all came back, I was also diagnosed with postpartum depression and put in an um, outpatient mental health facility. So like, I felt crazy. Um, people told me, Oh, you just, you're just a 
anxious because you have three little kids at home. And I was like, I'm not getting heard. I am sick. I feel like I have the flu every single day, but I was like, whatever, I'm going to go do this. And it was good for my mental health. I will say that it definitely did help. And I, I, I talk about this, my mental health very, very openly because there is such a stigma around it. I think it's getting better in our society, but we are, we still have work to do. Um, so multiple, multiple hospital visits. There was one particular one where I had been in the doctor, in a doctor's office and I, um, they were doing an exam, trying, you know, trying to figure things out. And I started feeling like I was going to faint. And, um, I was like, doctor. And my mom was with me at that point. I was like, I'm going to faint. I started like blacking out, I losing my vision, vertigo, everything happened. And, um, it became an emergency at that point. I lost control of my bowels, which was very embarrassing to admit, Um, but my body just was like, it was like my shutting down, shutting down, but also release. Like it was like, get out, get out. Um, like, so like, there's such a symbolism to what my body was trying to do. So that was happening. And they tried to give me IV, um, antibiotics. And then they got to a point where several doctors was like, were like, she needs to go to the hospital. So they called the ambulance. I went, my mom that day thought I was going to die. Like she didn't tell Mm -hmm. me that that moment, but she was like, that was, I thought that was it for you. So, um, they stabilized me in the hospital. And of course they were like, Oh, we just, you know, don't really like whatever. This was before I had a proper diagnosis. And, um, I came home and I was so sick. My husband was like, taking the kids to my parents' house. You're just going to have to stay here and we're going to figure out, figure it out. And I woke up the next morning, still feeling terrible. I still like, it was vertigo. I couldn't get out of bed. I tried to walk down my stairs and I just tripped and fell and just was like, that's it. God. Oh my gosh. That was the moment that I, that I surrendered. I was like, Mm, you know, like, you know, like give it up to God. I was like, this is no longer my problem. (laughs) And like, this is, I need your help. And it was whether it was like that mindset, but like that moment of actual, like surrendering myself to a higher power, knowing that like, okay, either I'm going to die and I'm cool with that, or I'm going to live. And if I live, it's not like, none of this is in my control anymore. That's really what opened up that door for that spiritual awakening. Um, and things slowly, very slowly it's like crawl like imagine a turtle they started to change but it was the slowest most excruciating yet most beautiful process that I needed my soul needed to really fully heal from the trauma and I and did you know what? I'm not talking about it like that's the beauty in this that's about I found my voice and here I am sharing this story that I haven't been able to share for 26, 27 years because I held it all inside. I'm glad it was incremental. I'm glad that it was slow because when you were a child, you had to rush it. You were like, get up, go back to school. So the fact that this was slow and followed a spiritual awakening was actually also a gift. It was such a gift. And if it was fast, I wouldn't have had a spiritual awakening. If my healing was so quick, I wouldn't be talking to you guys today with a book behind me. None of this would have happened. So I do see this, that Lyme disease and even postpartum depression and everything I went through as such uh, an incredible gift because I now can use this my voice and it's really more of like my soul's voice than like the physical Ashley Bernardi shared like whatever you're going through like you're gonna it, first of all it's temporary um one the other thing give it up to a higher power and allow yourself to feel and move through it and there are so many different ways that I teach that in my book too yes wow well thank you so much for sharing that um because it showed how you are just vulnerable in surrender and um, actually today I was he- hearing on something and it said how we should sometimes thank God for the things that he did not do. Mm. And this is just a reminder, yes, how he did not heal you fast, but how, um, and he did not have your life become perfect, how he actually healed you slowly, but how when you became so vulnerable and you surrendered, mm-hmm. how that helped you find your voice. And so, yes, that's amazing. We're going to take a short break, but when we get back, we're going to talk more about finding your voice. 
Um, before we go in the break, though, I would love to um, share with everyone about our thing that we're doing this month, our charity of the month called Freely Give, which is a nonprofit for empowering women. And I've talked about it for a few weeks, but the other thing about Freely Give, Inc., just to let you guys know, it actually helps and feed those in need, which um, we're in a pandemic right now, and that's, you know, great. So we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to hear more about her upcoming book. Are you wanting a vacation in paradise? A vacation to rekindle the passion. A vacation without the kids. A vacation where you can learn how to communicate, where you and your partner actually hear each other and gain insight. If so, Vacation Counseling is your next vacation. Dr. April Brown has created Vacation Counseling in Southwest Florida as a perfect option for you and your partner. Our retreats are one couple at a time. We have a variety of packages available to choose from, including virtual couples retreats. If you and your partner are interested in the vacation counseling, please visit us at vacationcounseling.com for more information on pricing and packages. Also, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. To keep track of the latest news, stories, activities, or coupons on vacation counseling and Dr. April's other services, we encourage you to sign up to receive a monthly newsletter called Intimate Connections at draprilbrown.com. Remember, if you and your partner are struggling with communication and intimacy, and you all are looking for a retreat to connect, Vacation Counseling can be your next vacation in Southwest Florida. Welcome back to the Bring an Intimacy Show, where intimacy is real. Today, we are talking with Ashley Bernardi, and she's just sharing with us on how the traumatic trauma that she experienced um, as a young kid and even as a mother of three with Lyme disease and how she surrendered and how that led to her finding her voice. So Ashley, I know um, you're talking about finding your voice and you have a message. How are those things connected and different? Mm -hmm. That's such a good question. So here's what I, so in, aside from not so strong, my day job is I, I have the incredible opportunity to teach people how to communicate their messages so that they're remembered, understood, so that they're relatable. Um, and what I always say, and especially after going through this experience, is that your mess can be your masterpiece. Your mess is your message. And it's so funny that I taught this for so long, but I wasn't sharing my mess. But now that I am, things are changing. Like I'm helping people. I'm being of service to the world. Um, it's my, it's, it's more, it's more than just me. It's like my higher power allowing me to be of service. So, um, your voice and your message is really your sharing your authentic true self. And there are several components that can help you be relatable to that, such as using empathy and even using your credibility and not, not doesn't that credibility doesn't mean, um, these are my academic credentials. Credibility is like, you need to, sh to share your voice and to be remembered, you need to build trust with your audience. So by sharing my experience, losing my dad so young, that doesn't make me like a credible trauma expert, but it all, but also makes me, um, makes the audience say, I can trust her because she's definitely been through a lot of adversity. Um, and so I teach all this, but I, I will say the most important thing in sharing your voice is think about like, First, like one, you want to keep it positive. I always say like using positive language, there's a huge difference in um, negative words and positive words. And I teach in media training, even the word no is negative. I don't know. I can't. I don't think. What are some positive equivalents, right? So like by, by me sharing my message and I say Lyme was my greatest gift and life, life lesson. I want to keep it positive because I want to inspire people. So when you think of ways that you can find your voice and share it, I want it to be positive. I, I think no matter what, like I found, I can find the positive in losing my dad in front of me and going through Lyme disease, I'm pretty sure anyone can find the positive in their message. Um, but it all also goes into like, honoring your, your mess. And you can call it your mess. I call it my mess and being willing to be vulnerable and share that with the world. I promise you, you will change lives by doing that. What would you say to somebody who has a mess, has a message, 
but they are so scared Mm -hmm. to be that person. So here you went from helping so many people find their voice. And then all of a sudden it, how you stepped over through this trauma, this really personal, personal one as an adult, like, what would you say to them? Like, like, what could you say to get them to take that risk to be vulnerable? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. So the first thing I would say is I'm here with you and I feel you. I've been there. I know how scary it is to share your voice because I spent most of my life not sharing mine yet also teaching people how to find their voice. But really I did not share mine and it for a lot of reasons. Um, some of the reasons were some of the first times I would talk about my dad, I couldn't get through a sentence without choking up. Um, and so what I tell people, and this, this is really like about finding your voice practice talking out loud to yourself. I really like this, this is, it sounds like crazy to do, but record yourself on your phone, sharing your experience to yourself and listen to how that sounds. And, and by doing that, you're like, oh, it doesn't sound that that wasn't that scary. Right. Versus like the first time you're sharing your message and you're in this like weird environment, you're not sure how it's going to come out. Do it to yourself first, write it down. Right. So like for me, going back to writing, sacred writing is so important. One of my um, close um, mentors, her name is Leanne Taylor. She's a spiritual mentor. She taught me all about sacred writing. And that's really about just free flow writing. And sometimes it's me having conversations with spirit guides, my dad, you name it, but like just getting it out on paper is one way that has helped me find my voice for other people. I mean, if you really want to find your voice, speak, speak, but you don't have to speak to others, speak to yourself, say it out loud, whether it's like just to a mirror and to yourself. Okay. I'm going to share my message. I'm going to share it to me today in my mirror. I'm going to share it on the phone. I'm going to share it in, on my zoom line. You don't need to share it with anyone else, but the, the fact is you need to hear yourself say it. That is the first step to overcoming that fear. So I found that once I started talking about my dad out loud, I started getting more comfortable sharing it with other people. And then once I started writing about more of my dad's ex- my experience, that's really where the, the book started to form. But I will say this too, and I think this is something very important to note that finding our voice, like the, um, it can be two different things. The, because the way that we write and the way that we speak are two different things. I don't write the same way I speak. And I can confidently say this because I'm a former network TV producer. So I used to have to write to speak, like writing scripts. So when you feel like you are, you want to share your voice, you need to think about like, what platform do I want to share it on? So first, if it's verbally practice saying it out loud verbally without anyone there, if you're sharing it, let's say on social media or blog or website, that's okay to write it. But I, 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 I see them as two separate things. Um, but the first, like you must practice, you must like, this is not the first time I've talked about my dad. It's the first time I've openly talked about my book involving my dad, but not about my dad. Because I, when I first started sharing that, I couldn't get it out without getting through a sentence without tears. But here I am because I feel so healed and inspired and, um, energized by sharing my journey. I I'm, I can, I feel like I have something to teach the audience now. That's amazing. And I'm glad you, um, specified that the different platforms, you have to be careful in how you say it and making sure you reach the audience. Yes. Um, it's so you want, so yes, you want to connect with your audience and there's several different ways that I teach that you can do this. I talked about using empathy in your message. So, um, you just think of ways that you can be relatable. This makes you more human and less robotic using your credibility. Like, and, and like I said, it doesn't need to be your education. My credibility is my Lyme disease. Oh, yay. You know, like it can be your messy experiences. Um, I also want you to think of in t- sharing your message and how to get it um, remembered. Tell a story. Why? Because stories are relatable. Stories are useful. People remember stories. They remember the outcomes of stories. I tell the story of losing my dad, which is a very hard story to tell, but it 
it starts the path of my healing right there. Like I wouldn't, if I didn't share that story of losing my dad, people would not understand my why for even writing a book or sharing my message. So telling, think about the story that you're, you want to tell. The other thing is I, I tell, I teach people, keep it simple. You want to keep it simple because you want to be able to have people relate to it. So as simple as possible. I mean, I know, you know, Dr. April and Dr. Kelly, you're both experts on likely very complicated subjects, but your audience probably isn't. So you want to speak to them in simple language. So they understand your message. So that means like not using acronyms, larger words, like just keeping it as if you're speaking to, I say like a middle schooler or above, because you want more people to understand what you're saying. Um, and then going back to, you know, shifting the focus from the negative to the positive, using positive language to really drive your message forward. People remember messages that are positive because um, positive language is more understood. It's useful and uh, people are going to remember you from it rather than causing confusion. So with negative language, like, yeah, I don't know. I didn't learn, you know, like Lyme disease. I, I, I don't know. I'm not the expert. I can, you know, any language like that causes confusion and it makes you th like you're someone who's listening to you think, well, what is she talking about? And what makes her the expert to talk about that? So, you know, as a call to action for any of your listeners today, if you can replace positive language with any negative language in your life, I promise you, your life is going to change. It's really all, I mean, like it's all about the law of attraction in my eyes. Right. So if you right. can exactly. flip the up, negative yeah. to the positive, yeah. even the word no is negative. What can you say instead of saying no? What can you say? So I, and, and the one, something, another technique that I teach is called power words, power words that help you move a conversation forward in a constructive way. You can use them in your message to get, to get your audience energized about what you're talking about. So a couple examples of power words that I love are I'm motivated by, I'm excited about. Um, it's, I've demonstrated that healing is possible using words that energetically lift you up to therefore lift up the audience. So I have so many techniques, but like starting there, I think I feel like I'm going to overload your audience right now. <laughs> oh, no, you can't do that. Uh, but, you know, it just reminded me like the story, like you're saying, you know, keep it simple. Jesus spoke in very visual, visual parables, and he had throngs of people following him and listening to them and wanting to be healed. And and just uh, I just had that visual of you being vulnerable, telling your story, keeping it simple on your lived experience and how encouraging that will be to the people that read your book. I feel like I'm in therapy right now. This is so therapeutic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I feel like I'm in therapy right now. So <laughs> thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Ashley, so I was wondering as people are listening and they're in traumatic situations, whether it's the COVID or COVID plus other stuff, losing their jobs and that kind of stuff. And they're listening and are they, they're asking a question. I feel like, do I begin writing now mm -hmm. when I'm in the trauma or do I wait to, I've recovered all of this traumatic stuff to- Good question. Yeah. Good question. Such a good question. So this is what I can share based on my own personal experiences. Of, and I've actually developed a framework for me that I've share, shared in the book that I encourage others to try to see what happens. So it's called the feel framework. So when you are feeling these traumatic, messy emotions, so if it's sadness, anger, grief, guilt, maybe it's all the things. This is something that I started doing um, as I was going through healing from Lyme disease and healing all my traumas. And I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm really allowing myself to feel. And then I thought about it and I was like, here it is. First, I focus on the emotion. You identify it. What is that emotion you're feeling? Some, sometimes you can't put a name to it and that's okay. Sometimes it's just that you feet physically feel it in your body. You know, like when you get anxious or yes. sometimes I sweat, sometimes I yes. shake, but like you're focusing on that. Right. And this can be done when you're meditating or just close your eyes and focus. Right. Then next enter into that emotion, like go into the eye of the hurricane, enter. Don't stay away from it. Go into it. Go into it. Go into it. Okay. Closing your eyes. Meditate. All right. Anger. Whew, where Bring are you it on. Let's go for it. Yes. Right on. And like, like 
for me, I feel anger. Like I can like in my shoulders, my shoulders are tense and you're like, all right, I'm here. Let's go. And like really sit and breathe on it and meditate it. And then that goes to my next E. So F is focus E enter. And then the next E is experience it. So this is the really uncomfortable part. This is why we avoid our emotions because we know they feel really icky, uncomfortable and messy, right? So you have to allow yourself to experience it. If you are angry, you sit there and you let that anger out. Like in, in maybe it's like you're screaming, right? And I talk a lot about, about releasing emotions in primal ways in my book, but like, however you want to experience that emotion, let it happen. Screaming, clenching, crying, laughing, physically experience it. You can also, if you're like, I don't want to physically experience it, <laughs> imagine what that experience feels like. But the whole process is that you need to move through that emotion so, so it's not stuck, right? This is something I've all found. The last is L, learn. So learn from this emotion. What is it here to teach you? So I could even add two other L's at the end. So it's like, feel um, like lots of L's. You listen to that emotion. What is it telling you? You could have a conversation with it. I'm angry because what are you here to tell me emotion? But then this is the, so important too. love that emotion. Mm. Thank that emotion. Love it for and being love. here. It's here for a reason. This is why our human bodies are so incredible. We feel anger and anger should be a gift because it's alerting us to something that's bubbling up for us. It's not something that we should push down and avoid and put in the dumpster. It's, it's, um, it's very much like yoga. It's moving through it. You're moving through it. So love it back. Thank you, anger. I feel better. So after you go through this feel framework, right? See how you feel. The emotion is very likely still going to be there. I'm not like, this isn't like the magic wand, like get rid of your emotions. It's still going to be there, but you're going to be feeling it in a different way. You might Maybe be I acknowledging can. it in a different way and you're going to be okay with it. Like, I, like and, and so that's the whole process that I have used that I'm encouraging people to try in, in their own lives, where, wherever they're feeling. And it can look how the feel framework can look, however you want. You could do it in the cars, you're driving your kids. You can sit and close your eyes and meditate. You can write through it. The F E E L focus, enter experience. What did I do to experience? I like threw a pillow against the wall, whatever. And then listen and love it back, love it back because, and thank it for being there for you. So that's my long answer. <laughs> I love your long answers. You know, I got this visual of uh, the whack-a-mole, like at Chuck E. Cheese. Remember back in the day when you got to go into buildings and play games? Yeah, mm. wow. What was that yeah, like? <laughs> right? Let's pause on that. But here is this whack-a-mole, and then it, it, the mole lifts its head, and then we smack it down. But And I used to take clients into like Chuck E. Cheese and some of these places, and I would let them just beat those molds, just like get that sublimation, get the anger out. I'm getting this visual now that what I should do is actually, okay, let's stay there. I don't want you to have, I don't want you to have to sublimate this and send it somewhere else. So thank you. I'm going to be able to help more people because I'm, I've reframed that. Oh, Good. Thank you. I I will allow them and give them permission to stay with that. And anger is not wrong. Otherwise we have a savior that was a sinner. (laughs) Okay. Anger, be angry and sin not. So they say, uh, scripture says, but back to this, thank you. That is something that I'll apply to my personal life and help my clients with. I'm so happy to hear that. And you just nailed it. Like my subtitle of the book is give yourself permission to feel and we don't, as a society, we don't allow ourselves to feel. And, and, and it, like, I get emotional. Like I'm feeling, just even feeling that like our culture, our society doesn't, like we, we hear our kids cry. We tell them stop crying. So wrong. What kind of message is that sending them? That's like childhood trauma right there. Um, we get babies to stop crying. They're tr- we're crying for a reason. Yeah. So, so my message to everyone today is just give yourself permission to feel however you're feeling, love that feeling, honor it, work through this feel framework to maybe experience the feeling in a different way. Like I said, my whole goal isn't to like have that feeling go away because it's likely not, 
but you're going to be looking at it in a different way and you might learn something from it. And by loving it, I think it's going to love you back. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I love that part of giving us permission to feel, you know, mm. we're going to take a short break. Um, when we come back, we'll have questions from the audience. If you are listening to this commercial, you have a pulse. If you have a pulse, you have stress. You may need a therapist. How do you find a therapist? Oh, you go to your phone book. Wait, what's that? Go to the World Wide Web. You type in therapist near me. And then you find a list of acronyms. LMHC, LPC, NCC. <sighs> How on earth do I understand this and navigate this? Go to drkellyboucher.com. Dr. Kelly specializes in helping people that struggle with anxiety, stress, burnout, grief, depression, compassion, fatigue, sleep issues, body image issues. You can have help today. DrKellyBoucher.com Welcome back to the Bringing Intimacy Show, where intimacy is real. Um, We've been talking with Ashley Bernardi and she was just explaining to us so much about being able to feel and how this culture and our society don't want us, I'm not saying they don't want us, but we are been trained not to feel, you know? And when we start to feel, a lot of us, we avoid it or we pour alcohol or we mm -hmm. do other things, get into other addictions so we don't feel. We kind of numb ourselves or run away from it. Yes, yes. And so we open it up for any questions um, out there for our audience. I have one uh, from Pamela who said, just a simple statement, thank you for sharing about PTSD. I'm not PTSD, uh, postpartum. Oh, yes. Um, we need a lot to of women are given permission it. for that. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, I, I think if anything from this episode, it's like we're giving ourselves all permission to talk about it. And postpartum is there's, I think it's so stigmatized postpartum depression. Um, when I was going through it, I didn't want to tell anyone that I was going through it, but now I'm like, let's go. I'm an open book because this is a re this is real. And I want to help women who are going through this. And just by talking about it, even it helps me by talking about it, but I know that by women listening, it is real. And, and I'll say this, um, you need to share with others how you're feeling. It's so easy to want to keep it inside. But once I shared it with my sister, um, she was the one that was like, let's go get you help. And I went begrudgingly, but I did. And I'm so glad I got the help that I needed. Yeah, Ashley, that actually um, was the next question that we got from Lisa in New Mexico. She was wondering, how did you have the courage to even voice it out to someone because she's afraid of being judged? Yes. I mean, it's, that goes back to like our society, right? Like, I, and I'm, I relate to that, Lisa, because I am a people pleaser and I want, like, I used to want everyone to think, oh, Ashley's so amazing. She does all the things. And I, and on the outside, I looked like this, you know, business owner with three kids and everyone would always be like, oh, you're super mom, you're super mom. But like, literally I had just had a baby and was like borderline, like just not wanting to live anymore. Um, and I, I think it was very obvious because I was so sick. I wasn't getting out of bed, but I went to, it was my sister, my husband and my in-laws. And so I would say like, it takes a lot of courage. So go start by going to people that you trust first and say, Hey, I'm feeling like this. I think I might need some help. Um, and at that point I didn't even tell my sister, I don't think I need help. I think I was just like, I feel this. I feel I, I, I mean, it was like, these are emotions that, um, one of my friends, uh, and she's, she, her name is Dr. Claire Nikagasi and she wrote the book, mama, you are enough. She talks about, they're called shadow emotions, right? Like that guilt, that fear, that anger that moms experience where I was experiencing, it was on a whole different level. And, um, I did feel like I needed to tell someone because it was all in my head. So I, sh I think I remember it was with my sister and she was like, let's go. And like, literally she 
came and picked me up at my in-laws house and was like, we're going. Um, and so thank God for her that she was so proactive in this. Um, and I'll say this also, I remember calling my doctor and, and I, I, it was like several months after I had the baby, I was like, I think I have postpartum depression. And they were like, yeah, well, you don't, it's not a new baby anymore. So you're just, we can't really help you. And that oh I did gosh. feel a little bit lost and stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I felt like I was doing the courageous thing by right, calling the doctor's office. And I was kind of like turned away and I was like, huh, okay. So that's when I was like, I, I really feel like I need to talk to someone. So I'll say this, like, if you feel like you've talked to someone and you're not getting what you need, see who else you can talk to. Um, and I know that there are like crisis hotlines for, for people, for mothers that, that you can call as well and, um, and get that help because sometimes it's just talking about how you're feeling. That's going to help you get to where you need to go. Deep. <laughs> it's deep. You I know, mean, um, discussion is not a joke. It's real. It, it totally is. Um, I have a, uh, question. Uh, it's a single mother of three. And uh, the mother in law, when they found out that they were uh, had postpartum said, you're just and inferred that they, uh, you had a baby, you should be happy. Mm-hmm. That's my summary of this paragraph that I'm reading. You, you had a baby, why aren't you happy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So not a real question, but this is just a statement in a paragraph uh, to you. From- yeah. Um, I was, I was right there with you. Um, I can't tell you how many doctors wrote me off when I had Lyme disease, especially, and I was anxious and, you know, I had postpartum depression at the same time. And they, they would be like, you're just a young mom of three, or the worst is like when people, and I say this in my book, when people tell you to cheer up, it's the worst. My husband Mm. would tell me to cheer up. And like, how do you tell somebody who is clinically depressed to cheer up? It's like the most frustrating thing. It goes back to like our society, not allowing us to really have feelings and not to not, it's like not okay to talk about them. So for you, like if your family isn't the right place to talk about it, I would see what you could do to find a support group to talk about it. It could be calling your local hospital or maybe like a local community center. Find like, and the beauty is like Facebook, social media, you can find online groups for, there's so many different types of communities where you can find that kind of support for free. Um, so if it's not your family and in many cases it's, it, that it's not, and that's okay. Um, it's just, and it, I'll say this also though, it is very hard for someone who is depressed to be proactive because they just want to sit and be depressed. I, I did. And so the, the, what I'll say to you is just do the next right thing. One thing at a time, just do the next right thing. Um, do if you're going to do one thing, do the next right thing. And maybe it's like today, I'm just going to look online and I'm going to fi- try to find a support group. I'm going to make one phone call because when you're depressed, everything is overwhelming. Everything, the act of eating is overwhelming. It's just not, nothing's okay. So just tell yourself, I'm going to do the next right thing and take it from there. And then from there, you're going to do the next right thing. It's and when you're in that depressed state, it's all about, I, I learned it's all about the baby steps for me. Sometimes it was like the next right thing is going to be me taking a bath. The next right thing is going to be me taking a nap. I mean, it was not productive. I'll say that it was just like very little baby things. Um, I eventually grew when I was, um, experiencing Lyme and postpartum depression too. Like the next right thing ended up me wanting to share my voice, but not, um, but not in like my message, but I was like, I want to sing. And if I can't, if I'm going to be sick all day and I'm going to be depressed, I might as well sing. So I took a step and I joined, um, a choir at my church and I felt terrible. I felt absolutely terrible. Um, I was super depressed, but I found that singing helped. And it was like the little tiny baby steps. And I'm not saying you need to go join your choir, but just do what works for you. Um, find those, those different communities online now in COVID times, everything's online to support you. Um, there, there is help out there. Yes, definitely. Um, one of the quick things that I wanted to ask you that we haven't explained yet, what exactly in your terminology is Lyme disease for people out there? 
Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. So Lyme disease, there's a big stigma around that too, because so many people have been misdiagnosed or it's written off. I was written off by over 20 doctors like, oh, it's not Lyme disease, but Lyme disease is from a tick. It's essentially this little bug that can um, bite you and um, a rash might show up. And it's like that. If you get that like deer rash, then um, you know, you have it, they treat you on antibiotics, but then there's other people like me who get bit and by this little bugger can cause all sorts of things. Now that also like to go, I want to say something to like, I had Lyme disease, but I also had a lot of trauma in me. So I, and in my book, I say that like this Lyme disease really triggered a lot of other things, mm-hmm. okay. um, but mine went undiagnosed. So when that happens, it turns into chronic Lyme disease and you can get things like encephalitis, like my brain swelled. Um, and because it went untreated for so long and, um, no one really knew what was going on with me. I thought that I had the flu. So it's flu like symptoms. If you get it, you feel like you have flu like symptoms. The telltale sign is a rash. People like me do not get a rash. They end up chronically ill. People end up in wheelchairs. I mean, it's a very, very tragic, Mm. tragic disease. Um, I am among one that has been healed from this. Um, and I'm so grateful, um, and also a spiritual healing to go along with it too. But it is, um, there's a lot of work to be done on Lyme disease too, with Lyme disease awareness and acknowledgement. I mean, May is Lyme disease awareness month, but yeah, it's a very serious disease. So when you are outside, you need to watch out. I used to think, oh, I don't need to watch out for ticks. I used to always pick them off my kids. Mm-hmm. Me. I mean, you know, cause you know, you're the mom, you right, like right. help the kids first. I've now I help myself wow. first. Yeah. So that's, that's what Lyme disease is. Um, and it can be very serious, but if it's caught early and you're treated, it's totally fine. You'll be fine. My husband has had it. Um, and you know, he had the big deer bullseye on, I think on his stomach and he was, he was totally fine. It just, I didn't get that. So doctors wouldn't treat me. Right. Right. And to come from, cause you had a chronic illness between that, the depression, the PTSD, mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. are chronic things. Yes. Yes. And how did that affect you to be intimate with your kids and with your husband? And I could that, that bond. You yeah. Know. I mean, there was the point where that was all crashing down and I couldn't be. Um, my marriage was really struggling. My kids, I, I, I was so sick. I couldn't, like I said earlier, I had the flashing lights in my vision and I felt like I had the flu and I, my nerve pain and I just couldn't get up. So I didn't, um, have the desired relationship with my kids. But what I did find was, and I look back on pictures and I was so sick. There were some really special moments when I found the intimacy of like all the kids just coming into bed with me and just snuggling. Because that's all I could do. I found a really beautiful picture the other day of like little baby Scarlett, little Kate, little Alyssa. And we're just, they didn't know mommy was sick, but right. they, they just gave me snuggles and love. And like those, there was, those were those intimate moments that we definitely had on that like soul connection level. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, and that gave you strength to fight, fight even more did it did yeah. I was like I'm doing I'm gonna get better for them um it really did and just those little just because I had a newborn it was hard for me to care for her but just sitting in that rocking chair um and having to give up nursing because of everything that I was going through was very hard too but just the ability to like hold her and be in that chair um I will say this though in like terms of like you know, physical intimacy, because I had at the point where I had um, been diagnosed, I had a pick line from my arm to my heart. And a pick line is basically where you, I received IV antibiotics daily into my heart. Um, My husband became my nurse, but we also had a home nurse come once a week to clean the dressing, but I couldn't pick up anything heavier than like 15 or 20 pounds. So I couldn't pick up the baby. I couldn't pick up anything. So we actually had to move in with my in-laws because I physically couldn't be a mom. I couldn't lift anything. Um, so that was hard too. So people would like carry the baby and bring her to me and I would hold her. And, um, yeah, we would find other special ways to be intimate and make those moments. They definitely happened if like looking back in hindsight, you know, I look at you now and I think, uh, if you walk by me in the store, I would think you don't have a care in the world. (laughs) And, uh, and it, what a beautiful story. I do have some resources that I want to share real quickly to any of the listeners um, during the show now or post. There's an emergency resource for the crisis text. Just text H-O-M-E to 741-741. There's also a National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is 1-800-273-8255. And NAMI's helpline, 
1-800-950-6264. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Ashley, it's been an amazing yes. time with you here. You are welcome anytime. <laughs> so <you>. anytime. <laughs> okay. Such an nice. honor. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share my, my message and hopefully help and inspire other people who may be going through hard times and it's, it's temporary and healing is possible. Let yourself give yourself permission to feel all the feelings. Yes, definitely. So yeah. if our audience are out there listening and they want to connect with you, how can they find you, Ashley? Oh yeah. Thank you. So am I, you can go to my business website, which is nardymedia.com. If you want to learn more about finding your voice and your message, you can um, see my book is up on Amazon for pre-sale. It's called not so strong. Give yourself permission to feel it comes out in November of this year. Um, you can also connect with me on um, Instagram. I'm either Booker Bernardi, B-O-O-K-E-R from my booking days when I was a TV producer, Booker Bernardi or Nardi Media on Instagram as well. And one last thing, your podcast. Oh, okay. oh my gosh. My podcast. Yeah, podcast. Yes. yes. Yeah. I can't wait to have you two as my guests on my podcast. My podcast is called Two Girls Talking. I host it with my friend, Anna Davalos. We are um, two former journalists and she's a current journalist at NBC actually, so, um, but journalists and two moms and two business owners. So we talk a lot about um, moms running businesses. We talk a lot about self-care. We talk about, about leadership. So check us out. We are on Podbean, Spotify, Apple, iTunes, Two Girls Talking with Anna and Ashley. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. It's a hard segue, I'm telling you, but I want to share about some uh, upcoming shows. Uh, Next week, we have Linda, Dr. Linda DeVillers with Simple Sexy Food. I found her book in a store and it was on, uh, it was all about sexy foods, aphrodisiac foods. I can't wait to hear about those very simple, sexy foods. April 1st, no fooling. We have Mike Cotayo. Putting Humor Back in Healthcare, April 8th, Sex Therapist, Marilyn Volker, and also Michelle Colley, No Glory Without a Story, which is actually one of the messages that we have heard today. Yes, yes. Thank you guys so much for being listening on the Bringing Intimacy Back Show. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. And uh, we love you guys. Don't forget to follow us on Patreon because we love to bring you guys educational, inspiring story. And if you really like what we are doing, give us a review. Um, Also, we have Clubhouse. Um, If you're on Clubhouse, we're there. Tomorrow morning. Yes, at 7.30 a.m. Eastern. It's for an hour. It awakens you. And so, thank you. Tomorrow's topic is vulnerability. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been the Bringing Intimacy Back Show. See you next week.